Hello my lovelies. I have been sitting on this video for a few weeks. I needed time to do the subject justice and the holidays just do not allow much extra time for research, scripting, and editing. Today we are going to discuss food deserts. This is something city folk hear about but most likely will never experience. A food desert is an area that does not have any grocery stores to buy healthy foods for your family at. When you live in an area that has public transportation, you can go to the grocery store and get home without much fuss. However, what happens when you live in a small town that does not have public transportation, you do not have a car, and the only grocery store closed over a decade ago? Well, Shopping becomes relying on the kindness of your neighbors to offer to take you with them when they run to Walmart. Before I go any further, I want to say welcome to Cape Bonnie Country. Thank you to all of my subscribers and viewers for stopping by. This is a small town in Alabama near where I live. I am not going to reveal the name as the good people that live here tend to want to be left alone and don't want much notoriety. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was a booming coal town. However, by 1960, the coal shafts became too dangerous and the accessible coal veins were running dry. The mines closed and so did most of the town. With no major employer in the area, those that could afford to moved away. Those that could not afford to move farmed whatever land they had for subsistence, commuted 20 miles or more one way each day to work if they had a car, or found other means of survival, whether that was becoming a handyman, setting up a flea market near the highway, or doing whatever they could to carve out a living. My family moved to another town about 15 miles away in 1978. At the time, this was the main road into town. It was a two-lane state highway with a speed limit of 55. Today, it is county road. The shoulders have been narrowed and the posted speed limit is 40. In 1982, the state decided to move the highway slightly west. The highway no longer passes through town. The only indications that there is a town nearby are some highway signs for the high school and National Wildlife Reserve, and a caution light most people just drive through never knowing that a town lies just a half mile to the east. Moving the road pretty much finished killing off the town. People started driving past and did not stop at the restaurants or the shops in town. Today, the town is full of empty storefronts in crumbling buildings. Some people still choose to move here due to the low property taxes and relatively inexpensive housing. It has become a bedroom town for those who work at the industrial parks 10 to 20 miles away. They just get accustomed to planning weekly shopping trips to stock up on groceries. The only grocery store in the town, a family-owned store that opened in 1926, closed its doors in 2012. The town became a food desert. Still, there are people living in this town whose families are generationally poor, do not have working cars, and rely heavily on government assistance to survive. They have no means and cannot drive 15 miles in one direction on the highway, nor 12 miles in the other direction to go grocery shopping. They are stuck buying all of their groceries at the gas station convenience stores or the local Dollar General. In this town, the only place you can buy meat, dairy, produce, and shelf-stable items is the Dollar General. Between 2012 and 2018, there was no place to buy produce at all, as this particular Dollar General did not add the small produce section until 2018. According to the 2020 U.S. Census, the town currently has a population of around 1,300 people. Other than a spike in 2000, the town's population has been in steady decline since the 1980s. 
The median individual income in this town has fluctuated between $15,000 and $20,000 per year for the last decade. Alabama is the sixth poorest state in the U.S. and 14.9% of Alabamians live below the federal poverty threshold, a noticeably larger percentage than the national rate of 11.9%. The federal poverty thresholds range from $13,171 for one person to $26,496 annually for a family of four. With a median individual income of $15,000 to $20,000 per year, the poverty rate, the percentage of people living at or below the poverty line, in this town is currently at 24%. Over the last decade, it hit 35% in 2016 and dropped to 15% in 2020, just prior to the start of COVID lockdowns. Most people living at or below the poverty line in this town do not have their own cars. They walk or ride bicycles everywhere in town. Given that the population of the town is roughly 1,300, and 24% currently live at or below the poverty line, it is safe to estimate that 312 men, women, and children in this town do not have reliable access to a grocery store and must buy the majority of their food at this Dollar General. This store receives one fresh truck and one general merchandise truck each week. Both arrive on Saturday mornings at this location. Dollar General does not have walk-in coolers nor walk-in freezers in their back rooms. All fresh and frozen foods are delivered in rolltainers and put directly on the sales floor. Staff must get all items into the coolers or freezers within one hour of the truck arriving. They have old standing coolers in the back room to place overstock in. Whatever does not fit on the sales floor or in those coolers must be wasted out and thrown away. The problem is that the truck does not arrive on a set schedule. It can arrive anywhere between 6 a.m. and noon. If it arrives too early or too late, then the staff required to stock the items into the coolers and freezers are not on site. If someone calls out or the store is otherwise understaffed, usually due to Dollar General corporate cutting hours, the fresh items might not get put away in a timely manner. I have arrived on a Saturday morning to find a single person running the register, no other staff in the store, and ice cream melting on the retainers on the aisle. I have been known to stock the dairy case myself just to keep the milk from going bad. Mr. Carl, a local mentally disabled man that cannot read nor work a steady job, spends most of his days hanging out in Dollar General or at the gas station across the street. He has been known to help stock the shelves and coolers just to help his community out. I took this footage with my phone at 11.15 on a Saturday morning. The fresh truck had already come and been stocked. Look at how empty that dairy cooler is. The truck arrived at 7 a.m. this particular day. The cooler was full at 8 a.m. The store sold all of that stock in three hours. All of those people that don't have cars know that they need to do their food shopping on Saturday morning or run the risk of not having eggs or milk available for an entire week. When the truck runs late and doesn't arrive until Saturday afternoon, they have to walk to the store a second time to get their milk and eggs. This was the frozen section one week later. The condenser on the freezers broke. Without a walk-in freezer to transfer stock to, the food that was in those freezers had to be thrown away. It took three weeks for Dollar General Corporate to send in repair people. The store was unable to receive four shipments of frozen food. This community was without frozen meats, pizzas, and vegetables for a whole month. 
and this store does not carry any fresh meats except for cold cuts. Now, let's look at the shelf-stable foods. Bread is received through a vendor twice a week. Other than a few vendor items, the vast majority of the foods come through the Dollar General warehouse. The Dollar General system automatically generates shipments based on sales and allotted shelf space for each item. The sales numbers at week's close on Saturday and historical data from the previous year are used to generate the orders for the upcoming week. At the time this video was taken, the truck had arrived but the dry goods had not yet been stocked. Most stocking of dry goods are done on Sundays and Mondays. Even after the truck is fully stocked, there will be holes on the shelves. All of the sugar and flour that arrived on this truck will be sold out by Thursday. Items that had stock numbers above the order threshold on Saturday, but sold out the following week, will not be shipped for two weeks. Those who cannot reliably go to an actual grocery store are stuck eating whatever heavily preserved, high sodium, and high sugar foods are available at this store from week to week. According to the Alabama Department of Public Health 2021 data, Alabama's rate of adult obesity is 39.9% percent, which makes Alabama the third baddest state in the nation. According to that same 2021 data, the rate of obesity for high school aged youth in Alabama is 13.9 percent. I personally blame much of this on food deserts. When the only food available is high in sodium, sugars, fats, and preservatives while having low nutritional value, people are forced to eat more calories in order to get the nutrition they need. The presence of the sodium, sugars, fats, and preservatives in those foods negatively impact metabolism, and their bodies end up storing the extra calories as fat. This is the harsh reality of living in an impoverished food desert. A reality that 23.5 million Americans face each and every day. According to data from the Association of American Medical Colleges and the USDA, shows that 54 million people in the United States are food insecure and 23.5 million of those live in food deserts. This means that one in six Americans struggle to eat daily. The country is now facing the worst levels of food insecurity since the USDA first started measuring this metric in 1995. There is a saying, sometimes attributed to Plato, Lenin, or Lewis, that every society is only three meals away from anarchy. Sometimes you might hear it as nine meals away from anarchy, and other times it may be said three days without food. With over 54 million Americans, one in six, experiencing food insecurity, can we really be surprised by the uptick in shoplifting? Are we truly surprised by a mother trying to sneak a dozen eggs without paying for them at the self-checkout? Or people walking out of Walmart without paying for that $400 TV when they can sell it on the street for $200 and feed their families? Or what about the 12-year-old kid selling drugs on the street so he can make sure his siblings have a hot meal that night and breakfast in the morning? While I do not believe that theft or other crime is justified, it is understandable when you realize that there are 54 million people, one in six, in one of the richest countries in the world that simply do not know where their next meal will come from. Inflation is killing the working poor. The system was based on the societal needs of the Industrial Revolution. We are in the information age now, and that old system just isn't working anymore. We have to figure this out quickly or watch our great nation fall into anarchy. 
Good people are doing bad things because their basic needs of food, shelter, and clothing are not being met. Is it society's responsibility to meet these needs? Is it on the giant corporations to accept lower profits in order to bring food and housing back to affordable levels? Do we allow capitalism to work itself out or do we adopt some socialist ideas in order to lift up society as a whole? What do you think? Personally, I don't have the answers. I just hope our elected officials can stop towing their party lines long enough to actually do their jobs, debate the issues, and arrive at compromises that we can all live with. If you enjoyed this look into rural life, or at least seeing the problem from a different perspective, please remember to like this video by giving it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to Cape Bonnie Country by ringing that bell. Share Cape Bonnie Country with your friends and relatives. And leave a comment. I want to know what your thoughts are. Maybe, together, we can learn a little something about each other. This channel is not possible without your support, so thank you so much for stopping by. I will see you next time.